Welcome to Royal Rebounds TV with Calvin and Barry. Just two crazy fans of the Sacramento Kings and they sharing their opinion. So be sure that you subscribe. It's for the fans, by the fans. Whether you chilling on the couch or wilding in the stands. For laid back conversations about the Kings, subscribe here. Staying down until we come up thinking this gonna be our year. We're here drinking beer, talking about the Kings. Be sure you subscribe so you can hear that bell ring. Yeah. What's up, Kings fans? Welcome back to Royal Rebounds, the Sacramento Kings YouTube channel for fans by fans. If you're a Kings fan, make sure you smash up that like button down below. And if you would like to join the Royal family with Calvin and Vinny and I, make sure you hit that subscribe button also. We have a very special guest today for you all. We have semi-pro golfer Matt George. He also covers the Sacramento Kings. This is his eighth season covering Kings basketball with ABC News 10. He also runs the Locked on Kings podcast on YouTube, so make sure you guys check him out. Thank you so much, Matt, for joining us today. Semi-pro and mega gol garbage golfer is what I will go by. But uh, no, I appreciate it, guys. Royal Rebounds is something that I think needs to be on more people's radar. It's been on my radar now for a little while. In terms of production value, I don't know if there's a better uh, full-on Kings podcast out there in the Sacramento area. So it's finally great to uh, be able to join you guys. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. That's a shout-out to Vinny, our producer. Yes, it's actually definitely. his birthday today. Yes, so Happy birthday, Vinny. Ha happy birthday, and thanks for coming in. All right, so let's jump right here into the topics. Um, I know this is our first time talking with you, so I, I kind of want to rewind about a week and a half here and talk about this new Fox and Ox pairing, uh, kind of what the ceiling or your, your thoughts on the ceiling, how this uh, style of play is going to work out, whether the Kings need to make any additional adjustments, just kind of your overall thoughts on, on this new Kings tandem. Well, it's absolutely an improvement, and that's not a disrespect or meant to be disrespectful towards Tyrese Halliburton at all because I think he has star potential, and I think he's going to be someone that, that Kings fans see shine in, in uh, Indiana not necessarily two years from now, maybe immediately, and, and say, oh, that's a, that's a, a tough one to, uh, to get rid of willingly and to move on from. But the reality is, like, could Fox and Halliburton have worked together? I think so. But were they working together? No. And the Kings are not interested clearly in waiting two years or whatever to have those guys figure it out. They're trying to win right now. They've been trying to win for 15 years. Uh, so the idea of them taking more time to kind of solve that problem when it wasn't off to as good of a start as we all hoped, I don't think was appealing to anybody um, compared to DeMontis Sabonis, who has come in and Clearly, he and Fox, even with limited practice time, they have an on-court chemistry. They work well. They complement each other. And that's what I think is extremely important is we look at the numbers of, of Tyrese since he's gone to Indiana. They don't surprise me at all. The dude's shooting like uh, almost 50% from the field, uh, like mid-40s from three-point range, 80% uh, from beyond the free-throw line, averaging over 20 points a game is an absolute assist machine. Like it doesn't surprise me at all that Tyrese is putting up the numbers that he's putting up for Indiana, and I'm absolutely rooting for him. And comparing, comparing those numbers to DeMontis Sabonis, Tyrese's numbers are better. But you can't just compare Sabonis to Tyrese in this equation. You have to bring in De'Aaron Fox, who is playing significantly better since Sabonis arrived. And that's because I think Sabonis and Fox complement each other better. And as we've seen thus far in Fox's career, when he is the primary ball handling guard, that is where he's at his most comfortable and now that he's paired with a big man that can provide the passing that Tyrese was providing without being the point guard, the primary ball handler, uh, I think it benefits Fox completely. So overall, this Fox and the Ox pairing has me excited. Even if this Kings team doesn't make the play in this year, uh, they have to make the playoffs next year, in my opinion. Um, if you're trading Tyrese Halliburton away, you have to be getting better immediately. Uh, and I think this Kings team has. And ultimately, guys... This team is a million times more watchable now, and at least there's something different, there's something new, and there's a direction compared to what we were watching a month ago. Fox and Halliburton may still have been the direction, but whatever the hell the Kings were throwing out there that they forced us to watch for the majority of the season, that was garbage, that was horrendous, and they moved on from that, and I applaud Monty McNair for that. 
Yeah, I agree entirely with that. And I was a huge Tyrese Halliburton fan. I did not want him to get traded. But I think James Hamm touched on this about a week ago, and he said that, you know, a good trade in the NBA helps out both teams. And maybe that's potentially what this is, Cal. Yeah, I think that could absolutely be what we're seeing here. And I think, Matt, you made a couple of really good points there. The first part about Sabonis being able to make up for some of the – the uh, point guard or true point guard qualities that De'Aaron Fox maybe doesn't possess or something like that is a, is a really interesting one to think about. And then also, you know, we talked, Barry and I, so much on this show for weeks leading up to the trade deadline about how the Kings needed to pick a lane, make a choice, pick a direction, because the direction, like you said, that they were headed in was the absolute wrong one. Um, you, you can argue whether or not the pairing of Tyrese and De'Aaron Fox would have worked long term. I'm interested to know from you, if you were in the GM's chair, did the Kings make the right choice by trading Tyrese? Would you have maybe looked to move De'Aaron Fox instead? Are you even thinking of it that way as a team Tyrese over team De'Aaron, something like that? I think the Kings absolutely did look to move De'Aaron. And I think Monty McNair, Tyrese being McNair's first draft picks in this hypothetical scenario, Tyrese being my first draft pick, he has the most value to me over anyone. And I think it's also abundantly clear that Tyrese Halliburton had more trade value than De'Aaron Fox did. And that speaks volumes towards Tyrese. But there's also one major factor in that, especially in this Indiana Pistons, uh, uh, yes, uh, Pacers, geez, Louise. Uh, <laughs> Indiana Pacers, it's the all-star break. We're all muddled. Uh, the, this, uh, this Pacers deal that is a really important factor, it's contract. Like Tyrese Halliburton is under team control for at least the next five, six, seven years. He's a bargain deal as the 12th overall pick compared to De'Aaron Fox, who just got max money and quite honestly hasn't lived up to that max money yet. And if if you look at a team like Indiana, who is starting a rebuild, why in the world would they want to start a rebuild taking on that much money, even if it's a better player in De'Aaron Fox? And I do think Fox is a better player than Tyrese right now. Um, I don't know if that will be the case in, in, in two years from now. Tyrese just makes a, a whole hell of a lot more sense. To me, if it were me, I would have done, I think what Monty McNair did, I would have shopped Fox around, seen what value Fox had out there, seen if I could get a player to that Sabonis caliber to pair with Tyrese for Fox. And once I realized that that deal wasn't really out there that made sense, I, I would include Tyrese in conversations as long as it landed me what I thought to be appropriate value in, in that checks two boxes. One is a better player. Like if you're tra- trading Tyrese Halliburton away, you're trying to get a better player, which the Kings did get in Sabonis. That's number one. Number two is, will that better player come in and fit with your already best player on the roster? And I think we're seeing that. So I applaud Monty McNair for this deal, even though I knew I know it has a significant risk element to it, especially with Sabonis' contract being up in a couple seasons, although uh, people around Sacramento seem to be less concerned about that uh, than maybe we were right when this trade went down, which I think is an absolute positive. But in reality, you have two years to find a way to make this work, and and it shouldn't even take that long. Next season, there are absolutely no excuses. And I kind of said that about this season, too. Uh, but no, this is no longer Vlade Divac's team. This is now Monty McNair's team through and through. This team has to be a playoff team next year or you're already running the risk of losing Tyrese Halliburton for nothing. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, we had talked to Brendan Nunez a couple days ago uh, about, you know, what our expectations were for this season coming into the season and what, you know, we would be happy with coming out of the season. I know everyone wanted to make the playoffs and stuff like that. But in Monty's press conference, he talked about how valuable this draft pick is that's coming up, and he was able to hold on to this draft pick. So as a Kings fan, if I were to start out this season, you were just to tell me, hey, you know, the Kings don't make the playoffs this season, but they acquire an all-star and they get a top five pick in the draft and they hold on to Deer and Fox, I'd I'd probably be pretty happy with that. You know, I, I do want them to make the playoffs, but I think, you know, in his press conference, Monty was so adamant about we're going to make another move. We've had times where, you know, people think that inactivity is or patience is inactivity. But now we're ready to be aggressive and we're doing that now. So I, I kind of want to hear your thoughts on what the ceiling of this Fox and Ox pairing is and uh, what potentially they could add to this in the offseason to uh, maybe increase that or or make that playoff push next season. 
I think the ceiling of this Fox and, and Ox pairing, and I, I assume you mean long term, not necessarily this season. Yes. Um, uh, to me, it's it's a guard big man pick and roll duo that is feared around the league. It is a um, a pass first big who can also score, who helps the Kings with their rebounding issues that they've had literally for years. Uh, paired that with the dynamic athleticism, speed, and scoring ability, attack mindedness of De'Aaron Fox. Like, I, I think you're looking at a duo that is good enough to cement the Sacramento Kings as a proverbial playoff team. Now, that could also mean a proverbial playoff team that's an eighth or seventh or sixth seed every single year that doesn't go anywhere, like the Portland Trailblazers have been with Lillard and, and McCollum, right? So, th- being a proverbial playoff team sounds wonderful to us in Sacramento right now. <laughs> But that might not end up being a good thing after your three straight years of one and done in the playoffs and you know you should be better. Um, So that's where the next piece comes in, right? And do the Kings become enough, excite others enough to attract a big free agent or get lucky in the draft lottery and make the right draft selection Uh, Does Davion Mitchell turn into something more? Can you wheel and deal Harrison Barnes or Rashawn Holmes to add that piece that you're looking for. Like there are options that Monty McNair has and, and him keeping hold of the draft pick uh, leaves a lot of those options open. And for me personally, guys, I, I don't know if we're planning on getting into this with this upcoming off season, which is going to be ginormous. We say that about every freaking off season, but this one is definitely going to be ginormous <laughs> right, right. for, for Monty like McNair. trade deadline. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. I, I would not be shocked. In fact, I would put my money on this draft pick wherever it ends up being moved. Like, I think Monty McNair is going to do everything in his power to improve this roster with players that can help them win right now. And even if there are talented young players in this draft that could help with that, and the Kings might end up drafting a player and going that route, I think McNair is going to use that pick and other players on this roster that don't necessarily fit, like a Rashawn Holmes, and try to find a veteran or NBA experienced piece or two to come in here and make a significant difference. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, the you bring up an excellent point about the off season being really, really huge. You know, for a team that entering the trade deadline, almost if not every player on the team was expected to be available or even moved. You can make the same case now about the players that weren't moved heading into the off season, as we don't know what's going to happen next with them long term. Uh, Rashawn Holmes is definitely one of those people. Harrison Barnes might be the most interesting one to me, though. You mentioned him briefly. I think he's been one of the more underrated players in the NBA for a long time now. Just a really, really solid all-around player that that helps a good team. You know, the key word in that sense (laughs) being good team um, with what he can do on the court. Do you expect, and I know a lot of this is all dependent on, you know, who's available or, or what the Kings are trying to do. Do they move the pick or not? But as it relates to HB specifically, do you expect the Kings to look to move him this off season or, or will we see him back in Sacramento next year? I expect him to return only under the belief that his position, that wing spot has been historically difficult for Sacramento to fill. Like we, I mean, you can even point to this season, how little wing depth the Kings have had. Suddenly they have a little bit more since this trade deadline, but still, I don't think it's impactful enough wing depth for the Kings to be super excited about it. I think Mo Harkless, he has one more year left on his deal. Uh, Harrison also has one more year left on his, his deal. I think it's around $18 million, uh, the, the final mm-hmm. year of his contract that he signed with Vlade. And I remember when Harrison signed that contract, the Kings were ripped to shreds for that deal with how much they were overpaying Harrison Barnes. And suddenly last season around the trade deadline, he was one of the best bargains and everybody wanted a piece of that. That's how good those, those declining contracts are. Mm -hmm. Uh, You, you front pay somebody, you kind of eat that negative PR for the first couple seasons. Obviously those seasons didn't go how the Kings wanted them to Vlade is now gone. But suddenly McNair gets two years of Harrison Barnes or three years of Harrison Barnes, and every year it's it's cut down by two million dollars. Um, Harrison uh, plus, I feel Harrison's good for another significant contract in the NBA. It still has so much to give. So I don't think the Kings trade Harrison Barnes unless they're getting a clear upgrade at his position. Maybe that comes in the draft. Maybe if they fall in love with a wing and they can pair Harrison and their pick to move up to a top spot to get one of those guys. Hey, maybe that's the route they go. But to me, you don't trade Harrison Barnes for a slight um, or a net neutral or a slight 
uh, on improvement. I'm, I'm looking for the opposite word there. Uh, a step down at yeah. that position. Like Harrison is solid. He's inconsistent at times. He'll have those starts of the season where he's averaging 20 plus points and shooting 50% from three point range. And then he'll have the weeks where he dips into barely 10 points a game. Like that's just who Harrison is, unfortunately on a team that is as inconsistent as he can be sometimes, but he is a rock. He's solid in that locker room. And he, you don't have to question what he brings on a nightly basis. Basically, you know, what kind of player that he is and that's tough to replace um, so I, I know Harrison has value. I think Harrison will be brought up in, in tons of conversations, but unless the Kings are improving at that position, I have a hard time seeing them moving him. Yeah, I agree. And you know, those front loaded contracts, like you mentioned are beautiful. I, I wish we could have seen the same production out of buddy healed because he was in a front loaded <laughs> contract as well, which I, you know, I raved about, I was like, this is uh, NBA 2k in real life, right? We're front loading these contracts and we're, we're able to re-sign a guy like Tyrese Halliburton or one of these other younger guys because the guys that we do have that are making money now are going to be making significantly less when the contract comes up. I see the Kings potentially moving Harrison Barnes just to get younger. Uh, I, I think they, they would consider a lateral move to stay younger. But if he does stay with Sacramento and he gets re-signed, I, I look at it kind of similar to what Paul George did in Oklahoma City is kind of like a handshake deal of like, I'll re-sign here because I'm happy. But if something happens and I don't want to be here, like give me your word that you're trading me and I, I'm out. So uh, I, I could see something like that happen. You mentioned Rashawn Holmes. I want to talk about Rashawn a little bit here. I know he's had a very crazy up and down roller coaster season. We saw him have a 20 rebound, 20 point game earlier this season. And we're all like that contract in the off season was an absolute steal for Rashawn. Then he keeps getting poked in the eye. Uh, you know, he's out with COVID, all that stuff. Now, I guess there's a, a cousin or something that's passed away. Uh, he loses his starting role. Now he's a bench player. I think that Monty's kind of in a weird situation, uh, not so much like Buddy Heald in, in the fact that he doesn't want to be there, but in the fact that you have a guy that's, I think, is starting a uh, quality player, and you have to keep value and keep him happy and let him come off the bench. So I, I want to hear your thoughts on Rashawn coming off the bench and whether he does have any value going into the offseason. I still think Rashawn is one of the better bargain contracts in the NBA. Uh, even if he is struggling through this season and in many ways, Rashawn's had the rug pulled out from underneath him. You mentioned some of the ways like he has been extremely unlucky this season with multiple eye injuries. Poor guy just can't stop getting hit in the face. Uh, he had the COVID protocol. He had the family issues that he's going through right now. And then on top of that, suddenly he goes from signing a contract into secured position as a starting center, albeit on a bad team to there's a two-time all-star that just came in and took your spot. Good luck trying to beat him out. Uh, uh, get mm -hmm. uh, Steal that from him. Like you you took the starting spot from Samuel Dallenberg. No. What, who, what the hell was his name? Uh, Three-point shooter. Went to Atlanta. Dwayne yeah, Dedman. Dwayne, Dwayne Dedman. Dedman. I don't yeah. know why I want I always <laughs> want to say Samuel Dallenberg. That's like way long ago, Sacramento Kings. <laughs> Dwayne Dedman. I love him I know. in Philadelphia. <laughs> Yeah, so Dwayne Dedman, you took his starting spot and then kind of Marvin Bagley was your competition for that. It wasn't as significant a competition as you have now uh, uh, taking on uh, DeMontis Sabonis for that spot. So to me, Rashawn just needs to simplify things. For the remainder of the season, it's go back to what got you paid in the first place. Like play with the hustle and energy and intensity that you provide, crash the glass, get back to that unmissable or uh, just pure push shot that, that always went in from around 10, 15 feet like that. Rashawn just needs to go back to playing his game, regardless of where he's at in the rotation, how many minutes per night that he's getting. Cause if he gets back to that, he will get more minutes. And I still think there's an argument for seeing what you have in pairing Rashawn Holmes and DeMontis Savonis together, using some of these 22 games to kind of experiment with that. And to answer your question. Yeah. I think Rashawn does have value still. Absolutely. He does have value. I think the Kings could uh, and, and maybe will look to pair Rashawn with their pick this year to try and get something significant. And I, I'm not going to pretend to know what Rashawn's value is. I do imagine his value has gone down since he signed that contract, of course, but 
could, let's say the Kings end up, they have the best odds right now at the sixth overall pick. So let's just say they get the sixth overall pick. Could Rashawn Holmes and sixth overall pick get you to top three? Potentially. Could Rashawn Holmes and the sixth overall pick get you a couple solid role players, three and D guys that pair better with this roster? I think so. So I, I think Rashawn can be an effective player. He will have market value and the Kings will effectively use him. I'm glad that McNair didn't just trade him for the sake of trading him, even though we know that Rashawn was uh, on the block and brought up in conversations, especially after the Kings news that Sabonis was going to stay here. Um, I would be very surprised if Rashawn Holmes was a King at the start of next season, but I also wouldn't hate it because Rashawn's a great guy. He's a hard worker. He's a fantastic teammate. And as frustrated as he may be, you're not going to see Rashawn pout. You're not going to see Rashawn complain. Yep. Uh, and that is extremely important in my mind. Yeah. His attitude and his work ethic definitely speak for themselves. And it's a really intriguing thing going into this off season. I agree with you. I think Rashawn will definitely have some some value, but I also think other teams around the league are kind of just salivating right now, seeing what's happening with him, thinking, okay, if he only plays 10 minutes a game for the rest mm -hmm. of the season, mm -hmm. I might be able to steal him away from Sacramento for something that you know, probably doesn't equate to what his real value is. So it, it will be uh, an interesting storyline to watch. As we move into this this uh, remainder of the rest of the season 22 games left starts tonight against the denver nuggets real quickly i'm just curious i've always had a or i guess i should say i've developed a love-hate relationship with the all-star game over the past maybe five ten years <laughs> uh, all-star weekend to me as a kid was always a really big deal i mean i remember the first time i ever dunked a basketball it, you know the dunk contest was a very very important thing in my life for a long time did you watch any of All-Star Weekend, and, and did you didn't. have any favorite moments? No, I didn't. I really didn't, and I haven't paid <laughs> much attention to if, – if the Kings have representation, so like Rising Stars games in the past, I'll loosely pay attention for that. I watched the three-point contest when Buddy Heald won it, and uh, I watched the dunk contest when Ben McElmore was in it, which we mm -hmm. can all forget that ever happened. <laughs> um, but – that this like this year i just watched flashes and, and highlights like the dunk contest to me has been underwhelming since uh, well i should let me backtrack we had really good battles between aaron gordon and zach levine yes. that reignited yes. that fire a little bit and where gordon thought it was, was robbed to revive to, what the dunk contest was all about i thought so like my favorite one of my favorite dunk contests of all time and people roll their eyes when um when they hear it but it was nate robinson versus like oh, prime right. dwight howard oh i love like, that's, that. that that to me was like not necessarily the golden era because Vince's dunks and, and sure. Jordan and, and things like that. Like there's a golden era of dunk contest. I don't know if that's in it, but to me, that was like, okay, this excites me. This was, it was different. It was fun. Even Blake Griffin jumping over a Kia. It's like, okay, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like what you would see in an NBA street video game, which is what I grew up off of. So I, that, I love that stuff, but now it's like, I've seen it all. And these kids, these guys are athletes, but they're not the best in the world because the best in the world are kind of saying, no, nah, I'm not interested. Like we never yeah, saw LeBron in a dunk contest, which I'm, I'm kind of okay with. I don't care. Like to me, the three point contest is far more interesting right. uh, than the dunk contest at this point. Even this year, I, I couldn't be bothered to watch like all-star festivities. Uh, they, they don't interest me now. If Sacramento ever gotten an all-star game, which we're far away from, unfortunately, um, but if they ever did, then I'd, I'd be all in and I'd be there to try and experience it, what it's like, because I know it's huge for the city and it's a huge social gathering. It's cool to see all these stars courtside rooting on each other and stuff like that. But in terms of the game, like I get Steph Curry went supernova and I, it was fun for me to watch highlights, but I'd rather watch five minutes of highlights of the game than watch two hours of defense that kind of looks similar to the defense the Sacramento Kings have rolled out for a couple of years. So yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, I've seen that defense enough this season. I don't need to see it on my time off. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Um, if you were to guess how many all-stars are going to be on this Kings roster next season, what would you say? Hopefully two. Hell, hopefully one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Because it, it's hard, even with Sabonis being a two-time all-star, it, it's hard to be an all-star in the West on a team that's not good. The Kings need to be a good team next year. If they're a good team, they'll have at least one. More than likely, that'll be Sabonis. But we've been talking about De'Aaron Fox and his all-star potential for years, and he has completely kind of fallen off that cliff, and that mantle has been stolen by John Morant. So if the Kings are next year at the all-star break, let's say they're five-plus games above 500 and are in like a top-five seed in the West, not that that's where they'd end up, but then, okay, maybe the Kings have a shot at two All-Stars. Or maybe they draft a, a young player that suddenly is like that next rookie that's in the All-Star game for no reason. Um, 
but yeah, I just all star. Don't get my it's hopes up, Matt. Up. Don't get my hopes up. I'm not trying. I'm not trying. I'm like, I, I feel wrong just saying this because it feels way too optimistic and way too over the top. So I, I'd feel comfortable saying one, but even one seems like a stretch sometimes. Oh, that hurts. Yeah. I mean, uh, we all want there to be one, two, three all stars on this team. But as you mentioned, the West, I, I know the records don't really show it this year, but there's a lot of talent in the West. And just being a bad team, even Sacramento, like we're never on ESPN. We're only on ESPN for the wrong things. We saw Tyrese Halliburton get traded. Now all of a sudden he's all over ESPN and and all this stuff. So, yeah, it's as DeMarcus Cousins would say, it's getting ridiculous out here, man. (laughs) Yeah, And, it's you know, it really surprised me how negative the response was to that trade. I know the Kings are low-hanging fruit. And I know, I mean, I was, my initial reaction to Tyrese being traded was like shocked anger too, because mm-hmm. I went, I said time and time on, again, on the Lockdown Kings podcast, like nobody on this Kings team is untradeable. This Kings team is so bad that nobody's untradeable. But if anybody was close to that, it's Tyrese Halliburton. Yeah. So when the Woj notification comes across my phone and says the Sacramento Kings have traded Tyrese Halliburton, I didn't even care who the name was. I was ready to throw my phone against the wall. <laughs> and then I read and I think about it a little bit more and I go, okay, I see what they're trying to do. And the biggest props... And the biggest, I guess, thank you that I can give Tyrese Halliburton, the the ultimate nugget of his King's legacy is the fact that a 12th overall pick got you a two-time All-Star in a trade. Like that, that to me speaks volumes for Tyrese Halliburton. Uh, And and that also speaks volumes that the Kings were able to pull off one of their biggest, if not their biggest trade uh, in, in, in history, a lot like are very similar to, and a lot of people have compared it to the Mitch Richmond for, uh, uh, Chris Weber trade. And we know what golden arrow that kicked off. So, um, but the, the negative response to it was really surprising to me. And it, 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 the continuation of that response has been really surprising to me, especially with the Kings having the success that they had in those first two games, especially the, the Timberwolves game like that, that it was immediate, like, okay, the Kings have something here. Mm-hmm. And De'Aaron Fox has looked so much better. We already touched on this and yep. nobody's talking about it. Like I see stat muse and I love them. They post the cartoon painting picture of each player and they show their stats and they, they posted one of here's Tyrese over his first four games as an Indiana Pacer. And they put up his numbers and they're great numbers. And I retweeted and I said, okay, now do De'Aaron Fox. Nobody's <laughs> talking about De'Aaron Fox. And I'm it's not true. saying that Tyrese yeah. was holding Fox back in any way, but that's such an important part of the trade that everybody is just ignoring. And overall Tyrese is the top guy on a bad basketball team, there's a reason why Tyrese is getting 40 minutes a night there. Fox and mm-hmm. the Kings are, I think, trying to win right now. And to be fair, they're 500 since the trade. Now they probably should be a little better than that, or they want to be a little better than that. But I'm, I've been surprised by the the negative coverage of it, and I hope that evens out. But as long as the Kings are in the press compared to another team, until they change their overall image, that's that's going to be kind of the status quo. Yeah, I want I want to talk about tanking and strategy here. I guess uh, you know it, it could be a full season wide. It could be just you know finishing out the rest of this season. But I kind of want to hear your thoughts. You know, I watch Locked On King, so I, I know most of your thoughts. But I, I kind of want you to let everyone else know that's that's watching. Is there a difference between you know trying to lose games or starting out a season like the Sixers did, saying? We're trading all our best players and we're trying to lose games to get a top draft pick versus being, you know, halfway through the season or two thirds of the way through the season saying, hey, look, we're not a good team. What can I do to set myself up best for next season? Yeah, I've gone back and forth with this all year. And I mean, you could catch Locked on Kings episodes a month ago where I was saying, I don't even want to hear conversation about the play-in anymore because that, that whatever that Kings team was that Monty McNair was forcing us to watch on a nightly basis, that, that team had no business being in the play-in conversation, even if they were two or three games back. Like they, they had no, the, the only reason why they were in the conversation is because the Western Conference has been such doo-doo this year. Like now the Kings are still three and a half games back 
but they have a direction. They have something that even if they go for it and miss out, it's not a complete disaster versus if the Kings had kept that team intact, went for it and missed out and remained in NBA purgatory, they would have gone into the off season with still this crappy roster, not so good of a draft pick. And all of us would have been going, what the hell was the point of that year? You just lit that year on fire. And some say you kind of lit last season on fire when you had no fans in the building and failed to take advantage of kind of that free time. So I am now in the position, and again, I've, I've, I admit that I've bounced back and forth with this. We all have. I'm in the. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I hate tanking. Like I, I really hate tanking. And plus, I know these Kings players; they're not going to try and tank. Now, the Kings might still be bad enough to lose games, even if they try. Which, hey, that might be best case scenario. I think this it might be the smart move for the Kings to try and put themselves in the best draft position possible. I think that might be the smart move. However. I think there's more value potentially in seeing success from Fox and Sabonis right now. Nobody would complain if Fox and Sabonis look like an absolute dynamic duo. The Kings make the play. And even if they miss the playoffs and end up with the 10th or 11th pick when they could have like the sixth or seventh pick, I don't think people would complain if we saw Fox and Sabonis excelling and playing well together, building momentum that the Kings can go into the off season with getting an idea of which players work on this roster, which players don't maybe Harrison Barnes looks like he's an absolute fit and you don't want to move him. Or maybe he looks like the odd man out. And now you feel more comfortable moving on from him. I'd rather use these final 22 games, try and win as much as possible as if it's the first 22 games of the season and see what you have and find out where you end up versus intentionally maybe slowing that down, not sabotaging isn't the right word, but intentionally holding that back or reining that in, maybe not playing Fox and Sabonis as many minutes as you should in order for you to increase your odds. Not, not like it's not guaranteed there. These are lottery odds. So are you going for the chance or are you going for the proven thing? I think I lean a little bit more towards the proven thing. Plus another element of this that we have to take into account is like I said, players aren't going to tank. Alvin Gentry is not going to tank either because he's coaching for his job right now. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I don't think Alvin Gentry is willingly, unless Monty McNair goes in there, grabs Alvin by the neck and says, hey, man, you got to do this, which he's never <laughs> going to because Alvin is such a well-respected coach in this league. Um, like, th- it's not going to happen. So the Kings are going to try and win games for the remainder of the season. Like I said, they may still lose because other teams are also trying. San Antonio is going for it. The Pelicans are going for it. Suddenly the Blazers are good, even though they traded CJ McCollum. Figure that one out. Like, they might still lose enough games to still get a tough pick, even if they're trying. And that might be the best case scenario, but I would not complain in the slightest. If Fox and Sabonis go 500 over these final 22 games, sneak into that 10th spot and get at least one meaningful elimination game that maybe they win and surprise people. The maybe they're the Memphis Grizzlies of yeah. last year. Eliminate or... the Lakers. Let's go. I'm about that. Like that's <laughs> right. a win for me. That's a championship for me. I'll throw a parade for that. Let's go. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> No, I, I think those are all fantastic points, and, and I, I've kind of, you know, tried to allude to that on this show over the past, you know, couple of weeks since these trades have happened. I think a lot of, of valuable experience could be made, even if it's just the playing tournament, and and it's a, what a lot of people may view as a meaningless game. You know, if you're bounced out right away, or two, or two, um, to have De'Aaron Fox and Sabonis play well in that type of environment. I think would go a long way for this team overall. Would it be better than a top three pick? I'm not really sure, but I do think that the Kings could gain a lot from having that experience. Mm-hmm. I want to take just a quick peek uh, look into next season. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got a ton of stuff that needs to happen before we get there. There's a lot of questions that need to be answered with this roster. Like we've been saying, we want to see these guys, particularly the pillars, Fox and Sabonis play really well. Let's just, for example, theorize that the Kings win the offseason from their perspective. Whether that's a top three pick, whether that's trading for the, the next piece, you know, that you were alluding to that could make this team take the next step. What's a realistic goal for what this team could look like next year? Because as we've talked about, the Western Conference is maybe degrading a little bit, but then you look at the division the Kings play in. <laughs> that's not degrading very much. I mean, the Lakers have had a bad year. They've still got LeBron. Kawhi is going to be back next year. Paul George back next year. Uh, the Suns are not going anywhere. The Warriors seem to be in a pretty good situation. So we all you know, think the Kings may be on the up and up here, and a playoff <laughs> berth might be true. But 
is that even realistic playing in the division that they do? Hey, man, those Pacific Division banners, they look a little more legit now up in the Golden 1 Center, right? don't they? Because of how good this division is. Uh, no, no, yeah, you're 100% right. Like, the Pacific Division is an absolute beast. It's, and maybe I'm biased, with the exception of the Kings, it's the best division in basketball right now. Uh, certainly one of the most difficult divisions in basketball. Actually, I might have to reevaluate that and look at the other divisions because the divisional system means nothing really in the That's NBA true. other the, than... The central their... division in the East is pretty good as well, but, but the Pacific uh, Division is, I mean... It's ridiculous. Regardless, like what's a realistic goal for this Kings team? I think it's not just a a play in hopeful. Like to me, this Kings team needs to be like bare minimum, like a, a seventh or eighth seed play in team. Like if you're a play in, if you're going into the plan or you end up a play in team next year, you better have a home game. Like I think that's that's the, I think that's the bar expectation for this Kings group. Uh, now. I'm also trying to be realistic here because even if you have a phenomenal off season, it's not too often that you have those tremendous leaps. Although we have seen them in the past, we've seen one just as recently as what the Chicago bulls have done. Right. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people have compared the Kings trading for Sabonis to the bulls trading for Nikola Vucevic. However, the bulls also paired that or partnered that with a sign and trade of DeMar DeRozan right. who's playing like an MVP right now. And the Kings typically struggle to attract that kind of talent in free agency. So that might be difficult to replicate. I could could also look at the the Denver Nuggets of a number of seasons ago. The Nuggets, this was before the play-in, they just missed the eighth seed, right? They just finished as a ninth seed, like a game back or half a game back or something like that. The next year, they jumped all the way up to like two or three. So they're possible, but... We haven't seen this Kings team make the playoffs and w- w- it was going to be 16 seasons. Like there's no way that we should expect that jump. So to me, shooting for just a ninth or 10th seed play, play and bid, it's not even close to enough. Like the team needs to be better than that because that's mm-hmm. what they are right now or that's what they were before they traded DeMontis Sabonis or rather traded for him and traded Tyrese Halliburton. Now, or going into next season, it should be, like I said, seventh or eighth seed. If you're going into the play and have a play uh, our home game, but in reality, top six should absolutely be the goal. And not just that guys, it should be a realistically achievable goal. I don't think anybody would have believed. And I don't know if we heard at media day at the beginning of this season, the Kings say, yeah, we want to be a top six seed. If, if anybody did, we probably would have rolled our eyes at it. Like <laughs> we were, we would have been thrilled with the play in next season. If DeMontis Sabonis or De'Aaron Fox or whoever the hell's coaching the team says, Hey, top six is the goal. We're like, yeah, damn well better be like, that's, that's to me where we're at. Yeah. I think Phoenix is also a great team to look at. You know, we saw that Mm -hmm. amazing run. They went on in the bubble undefeated, still missed the playoffs. And then, you know, they were able to make a trade for one of the greatest point guards of all time and Chris Paul, but number one seed next year, right. Or, or top, top three seed in the next year. So it is possible uh, we've seen a lot of teams do it. It's just uh, us in Sacramento. We have that cloud just constantly lingering over us that we got to break through. But uh, I think I think we're on the up and up. I really do. <laughs> it's you know, I, I've been a Kings fan for 25 years or so now. So I, I've definitely seen some ups and some downs. A lot more downs <laughs> than ups. But uh, maybe I'm biased like you. But I, I feel like we are on the up and up. I really do. Yeah, I think it's fair to say the Kings are. I absolutely think it's fair to say the Kings are. When you when you acquire a two time All Star and didn't have to trade away a, a boatload of stuff, I, I get you had to trade away a fan favorite and someone with All Star potential. But you traded someone with All Star potential and really nothing else other than Buddy Heald, which it's like that was a win for a guy who has been an All Star. Like yeah. there are so many reasons to think the Kings pulled off a great deal. They have two years to prove that. Really, two years to get that right. But in reality, like this, the Kings are on the up and up. I think it's absolutely, I mean, it's hard not, it was, it would have been hard for the Kings to go down from where they were at a month ago. (laughs) So you're right. They're trending in the right direction. And again, with the state of the Western conference, they've got a legit opportunity to leapfrog a bunch of teams here. I mean, there's a lot of teams that you have question marks as to what they're doing, you know, and it ranges from uh, like the fifth seed in the West. I mean, Dallas, for example, just traded Porzingis. It's hard to really tell how mm-hmm. good they're going to be long term. All the way down to where the Kings are, you know, at 10, 11, 12. So mm. big opportunity for them, I would say. 
Yeah, I think if, if you were, you know, a negative Kings fan, I know there's a lot of those out there. You would say, hey, we didn't just give up Tyrese or the 12th pick for Sabonis. We gave up DeMarcus Cousins, right? Because that's what it took to get Buddy Heald, who ended up being the salary filler in this deal. I don't know if I exactly agree with that because, you know, that was a risk that we took and it, it didn't really pan out. We were able to salvage it by getting a guy like Sabonis. But I think for me, this Sabonis trade, you know, beyond Sabonis opens up a bunch more questions. And that's going to, I guess, segue me into our next topic. And that's the starting five for Sacramento. You know, everyone liked Tyrese starting. I, I heard people, they wanted Davion to start as well and run this like three point guard lineup. Well, I think it's safe to say that Davion's coming off the bench right now. Uh, Tyrese is out. You have Justin Holiday in there. Mo Harkless is back in the starting lineup. You have Rashawn Holmes is, is relegated to the bench. Are you happy with the starting five that they've thrown out there? I know we'd all like to get a little bit more out of Mo Harkless offensively, but I just want to hear your thoughts on the starting five, uh, where DiVincenzo basically fits in here. Uh, what happens with Terrence Davis when he returns from injury next season? I think the hesitancy that I have with putting together a starting five for this team right now comes from the fact that I don't think the Kings have a true starting five. And that's something that they need to address this upcoming off season. I think they're, they have three absolute set in stone starters in Fox Barnes and Sabonis. And you can play Barnes of the four. You can play Barnes of the three. We know the versatility that he provides. So really it's finding that two, a win uh, and a wing slash power forward essentially is, is what you're looking mm -hmm. at. Davion Mitchell, I think there's an argument for him starting alongside De'Aaron Fox for the remainder of the season because screw it. Like, can the can the two of them play together and let's see what you have. Now, if you're trying to win games, maybe that's not the best strategy, but if you're trying to put yourself uh, or do some research or maybe uh, we can call it like next season training camp starting really, really early, maybe you want to see kind of what you have there or maybe even build up the trade value of Davion Mitchell and maybe consider moving him uh, during this uh, this offseason, which I, I would be a little more surprised that the Kings went that route. Um, I like Mo Harkless a lot, and I think people kind of forgot what Mo Harkless could be quickly this season because he struggled with his three-point shot, and then when Alvin Gentry took over, like he just faded and evaporated out of the Kings lineup, which I think was a mistake. Um, Mo Harkless is one of the Kings best defenders and he, it's important for him to get time out there. And, and of course the Kings are also looking to space the floor better for Fox and Sabonis who don't do that too well. So Harkless can do that, but also not as consistently as you want. I think Dante DiVincenzo is a solid pickup for the Kings. I'm a fan of his. I know that he's been shooting a high volume of threes to me. This is what's getting me through the short term guys. And I wonder if you agree. Like, I don't have a problem with Dante DiVincenzo shooting as many threes as he is right now because I'm used to seeing that from Buddy Heald and at least DiVincenzo plays defense and he plays <laughs> yeah. good defense. Yeah. So like it's it to me, it's still a net positive. Now, do I want DiVincenzo to do that for the final 22 games of the season going into the next season? Uh, that'll probably sour on me pretty quickly. My thought is I think DiVincenzo has starting potential but if the Kings can find a way to have DiVincenzo and Donovan Mitchell, rather Davion Mitchell, come off the bench and replace him with a more starting caliber three and D type player or, or two guard in that starting lineup, I think the Kings are in really, really good shape there. Mm -hmm. Um Rashawn Holmes, I would like to see him get some minutes alongside DeMontis Sabonis, not necessarily as a starter. I like Justin Holiday a ton. Uh, I was thrilled when the Kings got Justin Holiday back in this deal. I hope the Kings find a way to keep him around long term. I believe he has one more year left on his deal, if I'm not mistaken. It's pretty uh, team friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, he's he is a three and D wing. Like Justin Holiday is in many cases what the Kings wanted. So I have no problem with him being in the starting lineup. But he's another one of those fringe guys that I could say, are you a good team if he's one of your starting five? I think you could be a solid team. But are you good enough, or could you get better pieces similar to the Divincenzo argument? Could you get a better starting piece and have Justin Holiday as a really impactful bench piece? I could make the same case for Terrence Davis as well. So it's just a lot of fringe guys. So there's three starters to me and then a lot of fringe. And I think part of what the Kings need to do over these final 22 games is separate the fringe from the starters, essentially. Yeah, yeah, I agree 100%. Yeah, it, we're just one piece away, right? That's that's <laughs> what we've all come down to or what it's all come down to here. Um, as you would expect with any team that doesn't make the postseason for 15, potentially 16 
straight seasons, culture becomes a huge topic of conversation. How do you change your losing culture to a winning culture? How do you build a winning organization? All this stuff. You look around at other franchises all over the league that are consistently good, and you say, okay, they have all these great pieces. And it's not just players on the court. It extends beyond that into the front office and even into the owner's box. I've heard a lot of Kings fans this season put, a very large amount of blame on why the Kings are bad on Vivek's shoulders specifically. Do you agree with that? Do you think there's any val validity to those comments at all? Um, or would the Kings be in a much better position if they had different ownership? That's tough because ownership, of course, shouldn't have a direct impact on what's happening on the floor other than they're the ones signing the checks. But that's never been the case with Vivek Ranadibe. Um, I have been critical of this ownership group, and I think it's rightfully, it, it's fair to be critical of this ownership group, seeing as how there now are more losing seasons under them than there were with them when the Maloofs, when, when they took over. Like the majority of these playoff list seasons mm -hmm. belong to Vivek Ranadibe now. And I mean, his grace period, there, there will forever, and you guys know this, there will forever be a gratitude for Vivek for, yep allowing the Kings to stay in Sacramento, allowing us to drive into downtown instead of seeing the hole that was in downtown Sacramento, now seeing the beautiful Golden One Center every time you drive past it on I-5 and, and what it's brought to the city. Like there will forever be gratitude towards Vivek Granadive and that will, nothing he could do would ever undermine that. However, Vivek's story, who Vivek was, Vivek is very much self-made. He, he came over from India and was an absolute success and made himself. And I understand that it can be difficult for people like that to take over something like a professional sports organization and have a hands-off approach. And we've seen owners that are hands-on that do it in the correct way. Maybe this isn't the best example, but like what uh, Mark Cuban does with the Dallas Mavericks, he's very hands-on. Now, he's also gotten himself into trouble and gotten the organization into trouble for plenty of things. So I'm not saying yeah. he is the model to follow, but at least it's it's accepted that Mark is that hands-on and that team has won a championship and they had Dirk. And, and so it's at least been somewhat successful. It's never been successful under Vivek. Unless there's a and, scandal, then he's not involved at all, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no touching, not touching that. Getting my hands off of that part of the. I'm talking basketball conversation here, but you're actually you're you're 100 right in bringing that up too, and that's an important thing uh, to bring up and not to ignore. And thankfully, there, as far as we know, there haven't been any scandals or anything other than whoever that King's employee was that was just stealing money to buy property. Good for you, sir. Um, but uh, I mean, he's the only one in the King's organization that's won recently, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, the. Vivek has also had this this reputation, right, of just having too many cooks in the kitchen. I had former Kings head coach George Carl, who, of course, not the not the best history with the Sacramento Kings, right? Not necessarily the most <laughs> yeah. well liked guy, but I had him on uh, Locked On Kings a couple of years ago. And the thing that he said that that stood out to me mostly is he talked about how he and his basketball coaching staff would go into meetings. And Vlade was in there and Pete D'Alessandro was in there and Vivek and his son were in there and all these different people are in there and everybody's chiming in, but nobody's listening to George Carl and the coaching staff, the actual basketball minds really in the room. Nobody was listening to them. It was always Vivek's idea or uh, his son's idea or this advisor's idea. And the amount of advisors that Vivek has had and that continuous revolving door of advisors. Right now it's Joe Dumars. It was Chris Mullins. Hell, Vlade was an advisor before he took Paul, uh, Pete mm -hmm. Alessandro's job. Like it's just, this, it's been this revolving door and it's led to inconsistencies top to bottom. And we've seen with Dave Yeager and Brandon Williams having their, uh, their spat that ended up getting both of them fired. Like we've just seen issues that I think we can all connect back to decisions that Vivek has made as an owner, even the process of hiring uh, another, or when they hired Monty McNair, all the interviews, it was Vivek and Joe Dumars and Matina. Oh my God, I said the name. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Vivek's son. There are so many people in that room for these interviews when it, it just, it doesn't have to be that way. And Vivek even has said on Sports 1140 KHDK Radio that he believes no, I, or 
uh, any idea is not a bad idea or no idea is a bad idea. That's completely wrong, in my opinion, because there are plenty of bad ideas that the Kings have had and implemented uh, over his time as an owner. So is it all Vivek's fault? No. Is he to blame for at least part of it? Absolutely. And in the end, he's been the most consistent part of a consistent problem here in Sacramento. And I don't think you can ignore that. Yeah, I'm definitely one of those fans that will always be grateful for Vivek, for Vivek, for keeping the Kings in Sacramento. And, you know, I don't want to get too far off topic here with the whole uh, draft lottery and the frozen envelope and all that <laughs> BS. But I thank David Stern, and I will still forever love David Stern for helping keep the NBA in Sacramento as well. Uh -huh. But I feel like everything that we've talked about today is all valid, like Vivek would say. But the thing that's really important right now is tonight's game against the Denver Nuggets. So let's talk about that. I, I heard Davion Mitchell is back practicing. Uh, you know, what are you looking for in tonight's game? What do the Kings need to do to start this, uh, I don't want to say second half, but these last 22 games off right? Jokic is the perfect version of what a passing big man is. Like he's the cream of the crop and I adore Nikola Jokic. So DeMontis Sabonis I've heard is considered the second best passing big to Jokic. Baby I want to see that. I want to see it. Like, uh, it, it, does he look the same? I mean, I'm not expecting Sabonis to be on Jokic's MVP level. Let's make that perfectly clear. But two things. One, can DeMontis Sabonis can the Kings continue to run the offense through Sabonis now that they've had multiple days of practice time during this all-star break? Does that look better? Can they continue to run through him to where everybody's eaten like how the Nuggets run everything through Jokic? That's number one. And number two is can DeMontis Sabonis hang with Jokic trying to guard him? Cause Jokic can take him away from the basket, but it can also punish him inside. And I don't know if you guys feel this way. Like Sabonis is one of those guys that you look at him. I've seen him in person and on TV. And I'm like, he should not be as strong as he is. Like he does not look that big. Nikola Jokic looks big. Like <laughs> Sabonis doesn't look that big, but he's he's an ox. He's strong. Yeah. So I, I'm anxious to to see that. Plus, I love the Denver Nuggets because they're coached by Mike Malone. Like Mike Malone, I will forever be a Mike Malone fan girl. Like I just am, am such a fan of Mike. Um, and I I wish sincerely wish. Like I think honestly, the Kings firing Mike Malone was a better bigger mistake than the Kings not drafting Luka Doncic. Like I think the Kings would have been such a better in so much of a better situation. Easily the playoff drought would have been over if Mike Malone had remained the Kings head coach. Uh, that was a disaster of a move. And he's also a phenomenal man. So I'm always rooting for Mike Malone. So I'm expecting a good game, a good battle. We've seen the Kings oddly enough have success against the Nuggets a lot in recent seasons. Yeah. Um, so I'm expecting a good hard, hard fought game overall guys. I don't expect the Kings to win, but like I said, we got practice time or we know the Kings had practice time. Does it look different? Does it look a little more polished? Because in all four of the games, even the two games the Kings were winning, we saw moments where a pass was a step late or a step early or a little bit of miscommunication or some guys were just kind of chucking up shots as soon as they got their hands on the ball. Dante DiVincenzo is a great example because he doesn't know what the offense is. He's like, okay, I have an open shot. I'm going to take it because yeah. Sabonis got me this open shot. Like to me, Seeing things a little more refined, a little more polished, getting an idea of what the Kings and Gentry are trying to do with this group, that's what I want to see come through in tonight's game. So you kind of already alluded to it, but prediction for the game? I think the Kings are going to lose, um, yeah. but I expect it to be close. I expect it to be entertaining. Uh, uh, I mean, any game, even if the Kings aren't trying to win, I, we can't see really blowouts for the remainder of the season. We yeah. can't see games mm -hmm. where the Kings have, have uh, the, the floor has been wiped. And truth be told, the one thing that is inexcusable to me that we've seen once already since Sabonis was traded to Sacramento, it was the Brooklyn Nets game where Gentry only played Sabonis like 20, 25 minutes or something like that. Like that can't happen. Like yeah. if, if, unless you're shutting Fox and Sabonis down clearly together, if they're playing, play them together, even if the Kings are losing, I get you're not trying to risk meaningless injury, and you have to always keep an eye on that. Like Fox, if he's banged up, Sabonis, if he's banged up, okay, make those decisions then. But if you have guys that are capable of going and you have an opportunity to give them time together, don't waste that by only playing one 20 to 25 minutes. I agree with that completely. There's going to be another familiar face in Golden 1 Center tonight with the Denver Nuggets officially signing DeMarcus Cousins for the rest of the season. 
I think I read somewhere that this is uh, due to injuries and COVID and everything that's happened, you know, in the past five years. This is only going to be the second time and the first time since 2017 or something like that that he's played a game at Golden One Center since being traded from the Kings. Uh, just quickly, give me your your all time favorite boogie moment. Oh man, um, you know I <laughs> was not the biggest supporter of Demarcus in his time here, and uh, I never thought that the Kings had a chance of really winning anything with Demarcus as the number one guy, and I, I still don't. Um, that being said, it's an absolute tragedy what has happened to Demarcus, and he will forever be remembered to me as one of the most dominant, dominant forces uh, in, in the NBA, like dominance on a level that we hadn't really seen since Shaq. Like he was just that guy that's like, you can put five guys climbing on him and he would still find a way to score. Now mm-hmm. he'd also pick up a technical foul in the process <laughs> as, as we knew. But I mean, I just, there were, there's a part of me that will forever love and admire DeMarcus Cousins for that. Uh, favorite moment. I mean, it, it's it's an easy one. It's mainly his his only moment inside the Golden One Center, which is with, when he was ejected, and then the ejection was rescinded, uh, and yeah. he, he comes back out of the tunnel like it's a WWE entrance. And that's, uh, it was just it was that was a fun moment. I was in the building for that, so just the buzz, the energy in the building. It was incredibly fun. But that was also the game. I think one of you said earlier, like that was the game where afterwards he's talking to Katie. Yeah. And he says it's getting ridiculous. Like yeah. we know we know who Demarcus was and. Make no mistake about it. Demarcus is not as dominant of a player if that attitude isn't there. Like that's what needs to be. The Kings, if they ever took away or if anyone ever took away that attitude, Demarcus would not have been the same player. Mm. Unfortunately, that attitude got him in more trouble than not. However, if there was one freaking guy that could have gotten through to the man and did get through to the man, you had him in Mike Malone and you fired him as soon as Demarcus got viral meningitis, which why is why I say like <laughs> from that point on, the Kings punted any hopes and dreams right. that they had. I with was Demarcus. Another that game. familiar I was face that so will be back upset. in Golden One Center tonight, Mike Malone. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so to me, actually, it's important to note too, because this is coming from Sean Cunningham, my colleague at ABC 10. Demarcus actually, I don't think will be with the Nuggets tonight. And for the remainder of the trip here in the Golden One Center, because, and and I'm reading this directly from Sean, uh, his 10-day deal expired and his new deal does not begin until, I guess, the end of the road trip or something like that. I'm not sure how it's working, but Sean is saying that DeMarcus will not be with the team tonight, which sucks, unfortunately. I don't know if he would have played, but we we need some DeMarcus moments in the Golden One Center. He needs an ovation because he's, love him or hate him, and I certainly have felt both emotions towards him. He is forever a, a King's great. I don't think, and this is not a popular opinion here in Sacramento. I don't think he deserves to have his Jersey retired because he never won more than 37 or something, 38 games as a King. So he, to me, he doesn't belong up there, but you could also say, I guess like Peja doesn't belong up there. I don't, whatever. Yeah. Um, he doesn't belong up there to me. Right? And yeah. the contracts, not yeah. <laughs> allowing people to play when they want to play. Yeah, breaking news. You heard it here first. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I heard you say, and and I agree with you here, that the Kings, you know, were never going to really win anything with DeMarcus being the number one option. I I don't know if that's just because of him or if it's because you don't think that a team can really win having a center be their best player. Oh, no, I I think the uh, teams can win with their centers being best player. I mean, look at the MVPs recently. I mean, Jokic, Joel Embiid's Mm -hmm. probably going to be the MVP this year, and and now neither the nuggets or the Sixers have won a championship to be fair, but I don't think it was because DeMarcus was a big, I think it was just because of DeMarcus's attitude, his style, who he was like, I, 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 to me, he just wasn't capable of being a successful number one guy. I think he's a guy that had the keys handed to him probably too soon. Uh, and that, and then the Mike Malone firing, I think just, set off any chances of, of things working out. Like to me, you burned your bridge with him when you made that decision. Um, like I, I, I finally had a coach that I could trust and you fired him and pulled him out from underneath yeah. all of us. And that move didn't just piss off. If you remember that move didn't just piss off to, uh, DeMarcus, that move royally pissed off Rudy Gay, like yeah. royally because Rudy Gay re-signed his contract that year. So he could play under Mike Malone. And then Pete yeah. D'Alessandro made that move and, and pulled the rug out. Um, so that was that in so many ways, the Kings firing Mike Malone was a disaster. Um, 
I, I try not to make it an anti Demarcus Cousins argument. I just don't see Demarcus Cousins as a number one guy winning caliber player on a championship team. Um, and I will never really know because he and Anthony Davis yep. were looking really good sure in were. New Orleans before he got hurt. Oh, yeah. um, and, and some would argue he was better than Anthony Davis on that team. So we'll never really know, but at least from my understanding of DeMarcus, the player here in Sacramento, I just don't think it was ever going to happen. But also I admit the Kings did not do the greatest of jobs surrounding him with talent either. Although how yeah. in the world the Kings having cousins, gay and Isaiah Thomas all averaging 20 points a game and that team losing as much as they did. That'll never make sense to me either. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. And, you know, I, I see a lot of similarities here going on with Deer and Fox, right? Like uh, Deer and Fox said that he really loved Luke Walton. He wanted to play for Luke Walton. Not not that I'm saying Luke Walton is anywhere near a Mike Malone, but in the fact that, you know, maybe that's not a move that he was on board with. Then you look at, you know, the front office drafting two centers back to back for DeMarcus <laughs> Cousins and DeMarcus is pissed off saying I'm not getting any help here. Fast forward now, the Kings just draft two point guards in a row when their best player is a point guard. I, I think that the move they made trading Halliburton for Sabonis not only was to make them better this season and next, but I think it was a direct message to Deer and Fox of like, hey, you're our guy. We want to do whatever we can to make you happy at this point. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. I think the message was either going to be we're moving on from De'Aaron or we are fully committing. Like there was not going to be middle ground anymore. And um, yep. I, De'Aaron knows that he was brought up in conversations and I don't think the Kings are trying to hide that from him. Um, but instead of keeping De'Aaron here, but keeping the same kind of group around him to where De'Aaron feels like the keys are being taken from him. Cause make no mistake about it. How Tyrese was playing this season, Tyrese was taking the keys from De'Aaron. Like, I think it was pretty mm -hmm. clear. And I've said, De'Aaron to me was still the Kings best player and Tyrese hasn't reached him, but Tyrese was the most important player for this Kings team. Like in, in importance can completely uh, or importance can become best pretty quickly. So uh, now the Kings have said, okay, De'Aaron, not only are we sticking with you, we're committing to you by trading away your biggest competition really for best player status or, or the guy that's kind of coming for your job. Not that they hated each other or anything or had that competition between each other. They had a great relationship, but we're trading him away to get you help that you've never had before. We're trading him away to get you a big man partner that we were hoping Marvin Bagley would be, or not we as in Monty McNair, but the old regime was hoping Marvin Bagley mm -hmm. would be that completely was a, a disaster. De'Aaron has something now that he has never had in his time here in Sacramento. Now the excuses are gone. Figure it out. I think that's where, that's where the Kings are at. And that's where he has to recognize you got no more excuses anymore. You got a two-time all-star here. Make it work. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, Matt, uh, we got one more question here before we get you out of here. Thank you so much for, for joining us today uh the locked on podcast is tremendous work i really really enjoy watching it it's entertaining great substance great content i'm just curious for can you give barry some advice barry and i some advice here how do you remain so locked on after all these years with this team and this franchise <laughs> for two guys who are are still the new kids on the block here and and still uh you know getting our feet wet that's a tough question well, let me tell you something about Royal Rebounds that I think people need to realize. And um, I'm actually kind of disappointed in myself that I haven't um, been more familiar with and made it part of the rotation more. Because with with Locked on Kings, with Kings Pulse, with the Kings Beat, with James Ham, with the Deuce and Mo podcast, like everybody has different flavor. Um, but we all, uh, I also, the, the Sports Ethos Kings podcast hosted by Jill Edge, like, uh, and you can even, even throw uh, D'Lo and KC from ESPN 1320 in that group as well. Like we're all considered competition, but it's a family of people that one are tired of losing and two are tired of talking about a losing team all the time. But there's so much, I mean, we recognize what our audience is, right? And what I love that Royal Rebounds does is you say it all in your intro, you say it in how you present yourself, a podcast by fans for fans. And some people roll their eyes at that. And Locked on Kings is like, I toe the line all the time between being a fan and being a professional to where I don't think there's a line that much anymore. I don't, I don't, to me, like I grew up a diehard fan of the Sacramento Kings. Like mm -hmm. I, I grew up in Arco Arena, will forever be Arco Arena to me. I grew up watching 
the glory years. Jason Williams was my favorite player before it was Mike Bibby, who my mom hated because all I wanted to do was shave my head to look like Mike Bibby growing <laughs> up. Like I was, I, I adored the Kings and it wasn't just Kings basketball that made me fall in love with basketball. It wasn't the greatest show on court. It was the atmosphere. And it's something that like, I've been to a couple other NBA arenas. I've seen other NBA teams. I've talked to a lot of people who cover other NBA, NBA teams that come to Sacramento and go, Sacramento is just different. And it's because of the passion. It's because of the loyalty of fan bases. And, and in my opinion, Royal Rebounds does it right because you guys recognize that fans should and can have a voice. Now, I, I think fans go over the top sometimes. Hell, I go over the top sometimes. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I try to make sure that I, I stay as professional as possible. But I do get frustrated after bad losses. There, there are things that happen. Like everybody it's called just being a fan. It's called being passionate. I think that's far more interesting to listen to than a talking head who might be on national television, but also is saying that Tyrese Halliburton got DMPs in Sacramento and clearly has no idea what the hell they're talking about. Like if I'm a fan, I want to listen to people that I know are knowledgeable and passionate. And that's what Royal Rebounds is. So truth be told, the advice that I have for you guys is the same advice that I would hope you would give me and that everybody would give each other, which is just continue to be a part of the fan base, continue to be a part of the community. Uh, And I think it's on the rest of us, especially locked on Kings. And I'm going to make an effort to do this to make sure that you guys are not the new kids on the block, that you are a part of what our media, I guess, contingency here uh, is. I just recently unlocked on Kings did a uh, a media roundtable where I had Kenny Caraway from ESPN 1320. I had Brendan Nunez from King's Pulse. I had Frankie Franklin Cardicelli from Return of the Roar, which I didn't even mention. Uh, and they belong in the conversation as well. Uh, and then I had Jill Adge from Sports Ethos. Like uh, I had them all on and they're all competition. And I loved it because it's just, it's a bunch of people who know what they're talking about for a, just a candid, fun conversation. You guys need to be in those conversations with us. So I, I love what you guys are doing. And the production value, I, I, I smiled about and said a line about it earlier on, but what you guys do, the other podcasts aren't doing. And I think that's also incredibly important because it's unique. So I went on a long tangent, but I'm like, when I see stuff like what you guys are doing, it makes me proud because it remembers, it reminds me where I came from. Locked on Kings is something I took over from Jason Ross five years ago. It's become a big company, but locked on Kings is still just a tiny nugget in this big company. That is literally just me. I produce it. I host it. And believe me, there are days where talking about this team for 30 minutes by myself makes me want to literally jump out my window. (laughs) Uh, And you, you know what? You get through it because we love this team and what you guys have done, I think is fantastic. So I'm thrilled when you reached out to invite me on. I will return the favor and have both of you guys on Locked on Kings in the near future. And I hope uh, Royal Rebounds is on more people's maps very, very soon because it absolutely needs to be. Uh, and it's been a pleasure, guys. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, man. We really appreciate that. I actually have one final question for you. And I, I ask all the guests that we have on the show, and it's a difficult question, um, but what makes this season successful to you? And is it possible? Wow, this is, I just was so positive and so happy. And now I'm going to just like, (laughs) hey, all that positivity. We build you up just to break you down right now. That's that's Yeah, like guys, I don't know if it's possible. (laughs) Like I, well, let's put it this way. The only way, so it is possible. The only way it can be a success is if De'Aaron Fox and Devonta Savonis lead this Kings team to the playoffs. Not the play in, the playoffs. If they get to a best of seven series, I don't care if they're swept by the Suns and they lose by 30 every single game. That would suck, but we'd get two playoff games in the Golden One Center and that would be enough yeah. for a lot of us. Um, that to me would be a success. And that was the bar that I had for this Kings team set by Luke Walton and Monty McNair at the beginning of the season. I promised myself on Locked on Kings that even if things change, I would not adjust that bar. So even if the Kings tank for the rest of the season and they get lucky in the lottery and get the number one overall pick that I would be excited. I would be thrilled. I would not call the season a success because this season was always about ending the playoff drought and avoiding that streak. And to me, making the play in does not count as postseason playoffs, breaking the streak to me. It's yeah. always best of seven series. So that is yeah. the only way for success in my mind of this season. Well, we appreciate your honesty. Uh, you know, you've been consistent with that on Locked on Kings, and, and we really appreciate that and your thoughts and you coming on the show. Is there anything else that you want to say to our audience here? I mean, I want to tell everyone to go subscribe to Locked on Kings if you're not already. 
But uh, just uh, if you want to say anything to everybody watching. Yeah, Locked on Kings, uh, we just try and have fun as much as possible. And sometimes I'm goofy, sometimes I'm pissed, sometimes I'm ranty. And I'll be honest with you, some of my most popular podcasts are after bad losses when I basically turn on my mic, light a firecracker, and just say, I have no plan, yeah, I'm just the, pissed, and let's the go. The Detroit game stands out to me. I think that the title of your video is Matt George Loses His Mind. It, it <laughs> yep, was awesome. Yep. <laughs> and, and I mean, and look, we all, and you guys have said things that are wrong. We've all said things that are wrong. I put together a two and a half minute compilation of all of these stupid positive Kings takes that I had before the season started <laughs> very early on where I thought this team was going to be better than the Memphis Grizzlies. It's terrible, but I try and have fun with it. I also made a freaking rap video about why DeMarcus Cousins or rather Marvin Bagley is going to be better than Luka Doncic. So everything, <laughs> all my pride has been stripped to the bone. We try, to and have as, <laughs> we try and have as much fun as we can on Locked on Kings. And I know you guys do the same here on Royal Rebound. So uh, if you have the time and you have the energy and the passion to Add another uh, podcast to your repertoire. Make sure you, uh, you you tune into Locked on Kings. But please, please, please do not replace Royal Rebounds with Locked on Kings. We are our uh, a partnership. If you can make time for us, great. But if you have to pick between one or another, if Royal Rebounds is your roots, you stick right here. Thank you, Matt. We really appreciate you. We will have you on the show again soon. And, and Calvin and I will be happy to join you on Locked on Kings. So thank you so much. Uh, I just got to say real quick, go Kings. I hope they win tonight. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. All right, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to another Royal Rebounds podcast. We will catch you all tonight post-game live. Hopefully the Kings are able to defeat the Denver Nuggets or we can see some competitive basketball. Maybe we'll see, uh, you know, Deer and Fox and, and the Ox working on some new things here. Don't forget about the Falcon and the Lamb. Too. And the Falcon and the Lamb. <laughs> But thank you guys so much. Make sure you smash up that like button down below. Hit that subscribe button. And uh, in the meantime, go Kings.